السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين وعلى صلاة سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. I just wanted to really from the bottom of my heart welcome everybody here. It's a privilege and I thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It's a privilege, privilege is an honor, it's a pleasure that we are having this first annual iftar. I, I get nervous when the word an, first annual is there. It, it's an aspiration, it's a hope. We, but we have to make sure we have a second one. <laughs> but then we can call it annual, because we've actually done it. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Uh, welcome everybody, we're very, very uh, proud uh, to have you here um, and to, to learn. Uh, for those people uh, that have in their family people with special needs. Uh, because some of us know about it, some of us don't. And it's, it's good to um, be exposed so that we can make this much uh, more uh, special needs friendly. Just one comment uh, I will make, because I don't pretend to understand the difficulty people go through. Uh, my son, one of my sons, I'm a, they're, um, for eight years, he could not eat. He was allergic to basically all foods. And they were on a special diet. And we'd feed him and he'd throw up, we'd feed him and he'd throw up. And I was really concerned whether he would live. Because the doctor said, put the tube in. And I was like, I'm not going to put the tube in. <laughs> put the tube in for the rest of your life. I was like, I'm not going to put the tube in for the rest of your life. And I remember it was, uh, 10 hours a day just to get the calories in the body. With my wife, I didn't do anything, I worked right? to, put the, to put the work in. But alhamdulillah, he's, um, he's past that. He loves food, he needs pretty much everything. And uh, that's just a taste, I think, of the difficulty. But also it's a taste of the joy and, and the love that exists, the bond, the tight bond that exists there. So alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Omar Suleiman. Um, you know, this is truly a dream come true just to be a part of a promo about Muhsin after all these years of planning and, and getting it together and, and, you know, just envisioning, subhanAllah, what it would be like uh, for the Muslim community to have an effort, an initiative that goes out there and re mosques, uh, you know, an often forgotten group of unmosked individuals and unmosked families, in fact. That have people in their that have you know children that have people in their families that have these special needs and that have these disabilities. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Arshi Ali Khan, and today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my brother. I want to take this time to talk to you about my daughter Serena, who is Marshall six and a half now, and she's a bright, loving, kind, fun child who has this great toothless smile right now that she lost her tooth and. She also has cerebral palsy. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Fariyal Tahir. I'm 15 years old and I have a sister named Mehreen and she's great at basketball, she's a whiz at the computers, she loves to eat and she has autism spectrum disorder. When I was 19 years old, my brother was diagnosed with a mental illness, an invisible disability. At the time there was no community support or religious outlets that we could turn to for help. So instead of being supported, we felt alienated and shamed. There are so many families that are affected by this in our community, and we just don't see them, subhanAllah, because they're buried away while we're enjoying our khutbahs and we're enjoying our halaqahs and we're enjoying all the great activities in the masjid. These families have been completely barred from the masjid, and when they set foot in the masjid, it's the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. So for many families, not, we're not just talking about those that have needs and disabilities, many families the masjid has become a place to resent because when they walk in there, all they get are the dirty looks, all they get are the you know go home uh, sentiments rather than this is your home because the masjid is the home of every believer as the Prophet said. We just need a little extra help. We need a little extra support. We need a little understanding. But inshallah, we can get there. There's no reason not to. It's not asking for a lot. It's just asking for a little bit of a little bit of acceptance, a little bit of sensitivity. And I think an organization like Mosin is the perfect vehicle to do that, <laughs> inshallah. 
I pray for the success of Mosin, because had there been an organization that was around for us to connect to, that provided awareness, acceptance, and guidance, perhaps my brother wouldn't have been left alone. Perhaps my mom wouldn't have put herself to bed crying day in and day out. Perhaps families like ours would have had a place to go and people to support them through it. I, what helps me get through everything when we're going through a struggle with Mahreen is that thinking that Mahreen is an angel and if we hold on to a sinless angel like Mahreen, inshallah she will like help us on the day of judgment and she will take us to Jannah inshallah. And I, I would like other people to feel the same way. Inshallah ta'ala through this, through Muhsin, we can begin to show Ihsan to them and hopefully we can make the masjid more comfortable for them and they can make our day of judgment more comfortable for us by testifying on our behalf that we truly did ease the way for them. If you are if you or anybody in your family don't have somebody that you know of the disability, it might be hard for you to understand what we may be going through, but there's so much you can do to help. You can spread awareness and just being kind to somebody with a disability or if somebody a family with a disability and be kind to them and welcoming to them, that'll make them feel really happy. Also you can volunteer to watch them while the family gets involved in masjid activities. I have been blessed and honored to develop and work for the Ummah Center, a nonprofit dedicated to empowering the lives of the underserved, the alienated, the disenfranchised, the poor. We provide education empowerment programs and basic need programs. And with every person that I have fed, educated, clothed, and served, I pray deep down that there is someone out there doing the same for my brother. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to MCC's first annual special needs of THAR. Um, I'm Zara Fate, the woman behind all the emails you probably have been getting. Um, and I'm the organizer of this event and I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for taking the time and effort to come out to this event. Um, I truly hope that this is the beginning of a new wave of programs for the special needs community because I believe it's so important that the Muslim community is a place of inclusivity and a place where there's no disparities between anybody. Um, and at this point, um, I'd really like to introduce our three speakers. We're expecting one more, but um, we're just going to get started. Um, we have Abdullah Mojadidi, the far left, um, our far right for you guys, um, who works in recreational and psychological therapy. Afsha Hai, a proud parent of an autistic teenager and a credentialed teacher. And Hairo Kukwiza, a dis uh, diversity and equity counsel specialist at the Regional Center of the East Bay. Um, and at this point, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and what they've done in relations to the special needs community. Thank you, Zara. And thank you um, so much, um, MCC, um, for having this. So, um, yeah, I'm a proud parent of a young Muslim adult. Uh, she's 19 now. Um, her name is Anam, uh, with high functioning autism. Uh, she, um, right now, I am a credential teacher and co-founder of ANA Tutors uh, in-person or online tutoring company based in uh, Walnut Creek in Danville. Um, and I wanted to talk about um, my journey and particularly um, to try to help um, people understand and welcome all of you. Um, who are struggling um, with a disability in your family. Um, so my family was actually honored by Easter Seals um, in 2015 um, and featured as one of the stories of hope uh, because of my daughter's wonderful progress with ABA therapy, uh, which is Applied Behavioral Analysis Therapy. 
Um, and my daughter since then has graduated from high school and with a very hard earned diploma and attends college. Um, so let's see, she actually wanted me to um, share her story. Um, you know, since she's 19 and everything, I have to ask her permission for everything. <laughs> so she's she's very happy to um, help out and share her story to help um, families with special needs. Um, and um, if we can, we can play a two-minute video clip um, about um, her story at about 5.30. Thank you. More families, more services that we can provide, and do it in a very efficient way. Before I came to Easter Seals, I was first shy, and then Allie came in and told me about how to like open up and make more friends. I already had a typical child, so when she came along, I knew that something was wrong and took her to many doctors, and not everybody knows about autism, and it's pretty difficult and frustrating to not be able to have a label or even a support group to understand what's going on. But once we did, at the age of 11, she was able to get ABA therapy through Easter Seals and help her with her communication skills as she so very badly needed. Her communicative problems were becoming isolating. When she transitioned from middle school to high school, Easter Seals was there. I think Easter Seals has really helped her integrate with the group itself, whatever group it might be, and really blossom. The costume was amazing. I felt a little nervous at first, but I actually nailed it. All my friends were around me and I felt fine and okay. That's all that matters. Easter Seals has helped us grow as a family. From being a full-time mom, I'm able to actually return back to considering a career and going back to school instead of always being worried about my daughter. Like, I know that she'll be okay. Mm -hmm. well, that's about um, the clip about us. There's, if you want to take down that, um, the description there, you can watch the whole clip. It's just about um, what helped us, what helped our family was ABA therapy. Um, that may or may not help your family, depending on your individual situation. Um, but um, that definitely did help um, my family. And um, I, I think a community like this, and just having MCC open doors, as I talked to about that in the video, that it's hard to find support. So I'm, I'm very, very um, honored to be here, and thank you. My name is Jairo Guisa and I work for the Regional Center of the East Bay. Can you raise your hand if you know what the Regional Center of the East Bay is? Okay, 200 only. Um, so what I'm going to say is that um, before uh, the 70s, 1974 perhaps, who cares, but around that time, before that when a person was born with a disability or was diagnosed with a disability, whether it was autism, I don't think there were uh, many diagnosed with autism at the time, but um, cerebral palsy or other disabilities, they would be taken to uh, institutions and um, um, when I was hired at the regional center they showed us some videos that um, pretty much illustrate the conditions of those individuals. They were treated like cattle, like animals like they did not have humanity in themselves. That's how it was before. So in the 70s, um, the, that situation changed and changed with legislation that is called the Lanterman Act. Mr. Frank Lanterman was a legislator and he introduced legislation to 
uh, determined that every person living in California who has a developmental disability has the right by law of any service that will make their lives as normal as possible. So in order to implement that legislation, and it doesn't matter what the, the um, um, legal situation of that family or that person is, it doesn't matter uh, anything it, as long as they reside, as, as long as they live in California by law, they have the <coughs> entitled to receive services. So then, in order to implement the, the, the law, the uh, regional center system was also uh, implemented as part of the um, of the vehicle to uh, make sure that the law would be implemented everywhere. So currently there are 21 regional centers in California so that the entire state is covered by one regional center or another. The one that I work for covers two counties, Alameda and Contra Costa. There's another one in San Jose that would be um, whatever regional center. It is, I'm an old guy, so I forget things. Um, it's called San Andreas Regional Center. We have one in San Francisco. It's called Golden Gate Regional Center. We have one in Napa. It's called uh, um, uh, North Bay Regional Center. So that is one, one part of um, what the regional center is. So uh, once a person is enrolled in our system, then that person is assigned a case manager. A social worker who work, would work with that family to make sure that all the services that this child or this person needs are in fact put in place um, so that that person can have as normal life as possible. So uh, there's a lot of information that I can share with you but m mainly what I'm going to say is that that throughout the years there has been a constant in terms of um, the number of individuals who are not benefiting from the regional center. And for the most part, uh, individuals or families whose primary language is not English tend to be those that suffer or are impacted by the disparities in the services provided by regional center. And sometimes people do not use this, the services for a number of reasons. So I think when, when we have events like this, and I want to thank Zara and the center, and thank you all, uh, beautiful community, for embracing, for receiving us, because this is information that we want to share with you um, uh, on an ongoing basis. So um, uh, what I did uh, many years ago was noticing that the many families who are Spanish speakers, my primary language is Spanish, I am Colombian by birth, um, so, knowing that many families were not benefiting from the regional center services, then some parents, some professionals, and myself, we got together and we created an organization called Congreso Familiar, and that is a conference. Just as um, the gentleman said earlier, an annual conference. We were also nervous at the beginning because it's supposed to be an annual conference. We started with 200 and something people attending the first event at Chabot College. And today we have more than a thousand people attending every year. This year the conference is going to be on the 4th of August. If any one of you want to visit and go and see lots of families having fun, enjoying food, music, but also learning through more than 45 workshops on different topics, then, you, uh, then you're welcome to, to, to visit us. So what I think is that this is a perfect approach for the work that I do. My job is to make sure that nobody's left behind especially in communities that are impacted by the disparities. And I think this is exactly what we want to see in every community, um, uh, in every group that has been impacted. Um, so I have, um, I have some flyers with uh, the services that, that Regional Center provides. And, you know, at the end you can take one of them and uh, any inform any, if you need additional information or if you need to um, uh, deliver a message to the regional center. If you're not being served um, as you deserve, then you can talk to Zara, and maybe through her we can get your information so that we can follow up and make sure that, that, that you are receiving. Again, for me, my point of view is really that this is 
by law. This is not because we're good people or anything like that. Obviously, we're good people too, but this is mandated, and you have the right to those services that uh, the law requires that be provided to you. Thank you. But this is a beautiful panel, and they have such a fantastic message, I, because that, this is a real life story, as well as Rashida and my friend here, so I'm going to pass it on to them. Um, I'm not somebody with a special need uh, disability. I actually had a spinal cord injury in 2010, uh, October 22nd. I suffered a motorcycle accident fracturing my spinal cord, T4, 5, 6, 7, 8, for all you anatomy lovers. Um, in doing so, I'm basically paralyzed from chest down. And so, after three years of my disability, I discovered a center called BORP, Bay Area Outreach and Recreational Program. They offer adaptive sports for people with physical and mental disabilities. I'll talk more about that, about that later on. But uh, currently, uh, I do live a life as a, with a manual wheelchair, and I do have the ability to drive a motor vehicle with electrical, with hand control assist, but I can talk more on that later. I first want to thank Zara for uh, this special event and I want to thank everybody who worked directly and indirectly to organize such an event. Actually this is the first event that's happened in our Muslim community for special need children and we don't want it to be the last. We want more of it. Uh, so. Um, Today, I'm here to introduce my organization, Family Resource Navigators. And uh, Family Resource Navigator, it has been there since 1992, and it was uh, the project of Banana Inc. So recently, on 2017, we became independent as a non-profit organization, and we are serving all Alameda County. We work directly with families of children with special need, um, I mean with social emotional concern, healthcare need, and um, a speech delay or any kind of concern. So we are kind of like, uh, our organization is a parent-led and parent-staffed and we provide services for, um, for uh, we do more likely connectivity to services and we have uh, we're a multilingual program and service um, and we uh, we kind of like service families culturally responsive by by and for the, uh, diverse family so um, we have 12 languages we speak English, Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, Farsi, Dari, Arabic, French, Tamil. We speak Hindi, Chinese, and Mans. So we try to provide services in the native speaking language for the family. <coughs> so we have a variety of programs that I will cover later on. I guess this is just a quick introduction and uh, I don't want to hold a lot, but I will go through the programs and I will explain exactly what we do and you may find um, useful the program, okay? Um, at this point, I want to open up most of the questions of this panel to the audience so that you can all ask your questions to our lovely speakers today. Um, so at this point, you can just raise your hands and um, call on you. My name is Sammy. Uh, my brother has cerebral palsy uh, to an extent where he's uh, spastic quadriplegic, and I was interested and curious about the programs um, 
uh, more more social events that you guys kind of provide because me taking care of him and uh, he, he stays at home most of the times. So we barely go out. Sometimes we go for a walk, but we want kind of social events. Is there any programs that you guys have or anything like that? He, he does the work too. Like, he does power soccer, actually. Yeah, so if anything else. So you did spoke about the uh, goalball, but I'm certain you know about the youth wheelchair basketball team and the Adaptive Cycling Center, correct? No. Oh, well, great. <laughs> so, uh, as you know, we are located in Berkeley. Uh, there are There is the headquarters where you're probably familiar with the Ashby Ed Roberts campus where uh, our center is located, but our uh, sports centers are actually located throughout Berkeley. For the cycling center, we're actually located by, by the Aquatic Park. Are you familiar with that area? No. So Saturday mornings from 9 to 12, we have youth rides. It's usually coordinated for, uh, for people to come together with multiple disabilities or one disability and have a youth ride together. So we encourage families to come along to make it a family event. Uh, with youth basketball, there's also on Saturday mornings, so you may have to choose which sports you would like to choose. Um, cycling is more of a, a, a family-oriented sport, where basketball is more team-oriented. So depending on uh, his abilities, uh, he can choose which he will find more uh, comfortable. Okay. Is there anything where, um, because he's wheelchair-bound, he has no control of his body. Like, he has limited control? Uh, but it's, thank you. He has very limited control of his body. Is there anything where... It's like, it is, it's uh, like, you know, kind of, his wheelchair is also, how do I say, he, he uses a set, he uses hands, so is there anything where, like, is, is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. For the cycling, I've been working there for three years, so I'm quite uh, aware of what we have. So we have different uh, adaptive cycles where we can accommodate for him and include you with uh, the ride. So in other words, there can be two people and one bicycle. Uh, we do have uh, measures where we can secure his legs and arms to the bike, that way uh, the spasticity does not make his limbs uh, at risk of being injured. Um, at the same time, we do encourage uh, you to, as, a, as the rider with him, to be observant what's going on. Um, we do sometimes, we do encourage all the families to come along so that way he can feel welcome and you can feel welcome so we can accommodate all you guys with uh, cycles. What, what's the name of the place again? Uh, it's adapt, uh, Adaptive Cycling. At, uh, you can find our website, uh, but uh, it's located at 80 Boulevard in the Aquatic Park. Borb Adaptive Cycling Center. Borb Adaptive Cycling Center. Sonic. Uh, my older brother is, uh, has intellectual disability, and he's a recent immigrant. And I was just wondering what I need to do to get him to register with either the regional center or whatever uh, he needs help. Yeah, um, so any person can be referred to regional center. If you think that someone um, would qualify for services at the regional center, you can make that referral. And if uh, normally um, for someone to be accepted at the regional center, the disability had to start before the age of 18. So when the child is, um, obviously we encourage and we all encourage um, to start services as early as possible because sometimes even if there is early intervention, you know, as early as, you know, starting at zero, um, then some children may actually um, get the services and, and get, if there was something that could be rectified in the first uh, years, and Rashida is a specialist in that. Um, so then they can uh, uh, receive the services and maybe never um, belong, uh, be registered as regional center clients. Now, if the person was born in another country, then there would be some process to um, collect information that would prove that this person was um, had the disability before the age of 18, probably medical records, probably testimonials from the family. I am not in charge of that, but 
yes, uh, that person can benefit from the original center if you have something to say about that. Okay. Thank you so much, Karim. So, um, yeah, uh, there is no restriction whether the person is documented or non-documented. So anybody could be referred to the regional center. They are really good in providing services and anybody can do referral. You can go through an organization like ours, have some card here for everybody. And this is Family Resource Navigators. And uh, you can either go through it, you can do self-refer. And uh, there are five criteria to be eligible for the regional center. One of them is intellectual disability. So uh, yes, you um, you can do the referral as soon as possible. Uh, you mentioned the ages. He's uh, 60. Six. Six zero. Six zero. Six zero. Okay. I just wonder what Doesn't kind of services we can get. Yeah. So probably independent living. Yeah, so probably independent living, so yeah. he can be uh, independent. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, also you may want to look at in-home support services, so somebody can be around, help him do his basic uh, basic need, everything need, and uh, probably SSI, stuff like that. That's like uh, part of what we do at FRN is just to uh, help family connect to services, starting from special education to um, to in medical or insurance to financial services that are available to children or adults or whatever it is. We recently uh, got some grants to help. Uh, we used to work only zero to five, but we extended that uh, recently to the grant we received from the Regional Center of the East Bay and from BDS. Now they are finding us to work until the age of 21. And uh, we help uh, mainly, uh, there are few population like the Arabic speaking population, Farsi, Dari, Spanish, Hindi. Those are like five population that we can help until the age of 21. But if there is any healthcare, significant healthcare need, there is other service called CCS, which is California Children's Services. So that's also they can cover like some services and they can get some family navigation as well. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I have two boys with special needs, and my question is regarding conservatorship and uh, power of attorney, because one is going to be turning 18 next year, and the other one is going to turn 18 in four years. So the one with 18, I'm kind of worried because I know it's a lengthy process to do all the court paperwork for it, so I wanted to know what's the most economical way to go about it, if you guys have any information on it, because I have talked to a couple of lawyers about it, and it's a very costly procedure. So, if you guys can shed some light on that for me, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll try. I'll try. Okay, so um, I guess you're Farsi speaker, yeah? So, I want you to, uh, I want to give you a card of uh, one of my colleagues. She can help you through that, and she is working with Farsi speaking population. I brought her <laughs> cards here. So, um, please give us a call. <laughs> it's like very hard for me to explain every step here, but we, you're definitely gonna get a family navigation that works one on one with you, okay? So, mm -hmm. um my question is, have you worked with Disability Rights California? No, I haven't, but both of the kids are, are registered with regional. Yeah, Disability Rights California provides um, services at no cost, so they have lawyers and that, that's what they do, mm -hmm. is to, to uh, provide assistance, legal assistance, mm -hmm. to clients of the regional center, and sometimes um, even um, to fight the regional center, but the regional center is not doing uh, our job properly, then Disability Rights California intervenes with their lawyers and their legal um, uh, personnel to support families. So I can give you, later, I can, you know, if you talk to Sarah, I can send names uh, of individuals that we work with 
um, and can, can do some research in terms of um, uh, quite a bit. Of, I don't think there is any cost associated with that for, from, from lawyers from Disability Rights California. They're also part of the system and they are there to support you, to support you. Yeah. Sound like everybody? My name is Ahmed Madudi. Um, I actually represent MCA's BAMREC. I also wanted to ask the board as well if I could shed some light. Uh, and we also, so because we're also located in the Pleasanton area, we also have a Santa Clara area, MCA, if people are aware of that, near San Jose. We actually have a program called BAMREC for the youth, 7 to 13, and we actually provide recreational activities. So if they are uh, a potential, you know, if they want to still integrate themselves to uh, kids who are also able, um, we, can, we, we offer that. Um, we also want to provide a way to maybe we can do a partnership for people who don't have to come all the way to Hayward or they can come to San Jose. Um, we also want to integrate an activity program. So we have uh, rock climbing, we have canoeing, we have basketball, we have football, we have basketball, everything. Um, we also want to integrate, maybe we can ask the, uh, teach the parents here, we want to integrate a kind of like a video game kind of uh, place where kids can also learn how to use a computer, coding, Microsoft, spreadsheet, uh, you can be able to play video games if that's up to the parents. Um, and I want to ask the board if this is okay to integrate uh, this program with you guys. Thank you. We're asking the board of MTC. Yeah. Yeah. Something we definitely take into consideration. We are looking for better ways to conserve this population. So Sister Zara and I will talk to you afterwards, inshallah. Other questions? At this point, um, I just want to go down the line and hear from each of you on how you individually believe that the rest of the community can, what they can do to kind of be more inclusive of the special needs community and the kind of programs and implementations we need, especially for the mosque here, to kind of make it more friendly to this community. I, I personally do believe events like this, outreach to the community and integration can really help and bring awareness. Uh, we, uh, we should do more of this actually. We should plan Eid events, plan other events in which we spray the word and spread the resources available for them to make it easy for the family as well as receiving services for the kids because parenting a child with special needs is really really hard physically and emotionally can be stressful and this family not only that they need to uh, seek services for to help their kids they themselves need support and there are a lot of support in the community you just need to know about them Um, well, I have um, a lot of suggestions. Um, it depends. Um, I will tell you what, what helped for our family. Um, one was, uh, number one is to allow others to help. Um, you know, and let your, like say if you have extended family, like I, for example, I wanted my daughter to read the Quran. Um, and she already had a speech delay and she's academically, she had a language disability. So um, that was tough. But um, I was like, you know, overwhelmed um, with the academics. Um, so I, I kind of resourced that out to my mom. <laughs> she was here today. And um, she, was, she would call her again and again and again <laughs> to Alhamdulillah until she finished the whole Quran. Um, I also had private tutors uh, for her. <laughs> academically because the special um, ed program that she was in for most of her life it was more from like a contained classroom so they they were great for Sahar to maintain her self-esteem um, that's key because you don't want them to hate learning but the challenge is to challenge the child you know to kind of uh, not really to the brink of frustration but you know, just to challenge them as, as much as we can, um, I would do that or I'd hire private tutors to do that. Um, and so the, that's kind of how I 
got her to kind of get out of special ed um, after the ABA therapy kind of relaxed her anxiety, her social anxiety, then alhamdulillah, I think her brain kind of improved. She was able to then uh, take in more academics. And then as therapy for ABA stopped, after school we had more time also for tutoring, et cetera. So then she was able to switch from certificate track to then grad track and then able to um, alhamdulillah um, get a diploma. So um, <coughs> I also did like Islamic school, I did Girl Scouts, um, at, at SRVIC, um, what else, um, there was, um, things that I wished that were there when she was growing up was something like the Khalil Center, um, uh, which they have now, uh, we didn't have that back then when she was growing up, but this, they do have Khalil Center, um, they have take appointments, counseling appointments here, I wish we had that, um, when, when she was growing up, but you guys are lucky that it is here now, mm -hmm. I would, encourage you to take advantage of that. That's like uh, more Islamic and spiritual based counseling. So you don't feel that, you're, that, that your values are being compromised if you go to therapy or something, you know. It's gonna be, you know, they're not gonna tell you, well, you know, you're an adult, so just get out of the house and you know, things like that. It's gonna be as, you know, needed for your family situation, including your spiritual aspect too. Um, also, look at the strengths of your child. Don't just look at the negative stuff. If you just look at the negative stuff, you're always going to be um, kind of exhibiting also negative feedback to your kid. So be positive and try to look at something positive that, that you, their child can do. Um, are they a good artist? Are they good? My daughter was musical, for example. So I always made sure, and you saw that in that video clip, that she was, I knew that she was musical. She could do music at a pace that everyone else could normally do music. So um, she was in orchestra and I encouraged that part. And then she told me uh, when she was growing up, like she was like in fourth grade at that time, that's when her music class started. And she said, mom, I like that music class because it makes me feel normal. So she understood the difference between special ed and, and then the general ed setting and where, where the music class was. So it's, and again, that helps her self-esteem. So, so as not to define her and um, I didn't tell her the, her label either that's a judgment call on you on your part when you want to tell your child what, what it, if it helps them or if it doesn't help them you would be the best judge of that again counseling things like that like would also help either from your medical insurance that's fine or from the Hulu Center um, um, let's see what else the care center there's a care parent network um, and Martinez, um, I think they also have other branches as well. They're pretty good as well to help organize, you know, IEP paperwork, which can stack up and medical report and all these other things that you need to be organized. You need to be the best advocate for your child. How to do that? You need to first get your stuff together, <laughs> get your papers together. And there are organizations like uh, the Care Parent Network who will help you. Um, so. Let's see what else. Um, yeah, I mean, I also took her to Kumon. I also did active reading clinic um, because she was late in reading. So, um, you know, to try to help her read, um, they use like a program that uh, was developed by someone with dyslexia. Back, I can't say dyslexia. Dyslexia, and so she she actually um, organized that program and used more sound movements to. Um, uh, help a child read mm -hmm. instead of just how they do it in school, which is very different. Um, you know, it's mainly just auditory and um, visual. So using uh, like motions um, would be a different um, neural pathway that helped my child and might help yours to help read. So the brain is amazing. So you never know what might help your child, um, you know, get past um, whatever, um, you know, hurdle that they need. Um, and a child advocate, I did hire a child advocate at some point for IEPs, um, care parent network and regional center also had at times uh, being a part of the IEP team. Um, sometimes during IEP means individual educational plan. How many people know what IEPs are? Raise your hand. Okay. So you're on board, and you know you might feel outnumbered in that IEP board room. 
So you want to, if you want to have other people on your side, sometimes regional center would be happy to, they used to come out at least, and be a part of um, um, the IP meetings and, um, you know, for proper representation of, um, you know, and, and I mean, always work as a team. Don't think people like parents and teachers, like I've been on both sides of the table now, being an educator myself, I'm a California credential teacher, so I've been on the side where, um, you know, there's parents and families on the other side, and I am the teacher telling them, you know, this is as, sens as sensitively as possible, you know, that what your child needs to learn or what they're working on, what their strengths and weaknesses are. So, um, um, yeah, what else? So, yeah, there's a lot out there, so yeah, I'll be happy to talk with you individually as well, if you'd like. Okay, I just need a couple of hours to say what I'm going to say, so let me see. Um, uh, I think, um, reflecting a little bit about how it was in my own country when I was growing up, and uh, when a child, when there was a child with special needs, uh, there were terrible names for them, and people felt ashamed of, the, of those children, so there's shame there is stigma associated with having a child, and I think one of the things that we all can do together is to fight those things uh, internally and also uh, in the larger community. So um, um, I am extremely happy to see that this center is taking these steps to create the conditions for families with special needs to to feel good about themselves, about their children, to feel proud of them, to celebrate them. So I would say that any effort that is done to break the isolation, break the isolation, when you have a child with special needs and you feel isolated, that people don't care about you, people don't know about your struggles, people judge you, you know, they, or they have their own views of things, then that, as opposed to having a community that embraces these families, that this is not, maybe there is a, an annual event, but actually, um, we're almost done. Oh, um, that, that um, it's an annual event, but I would say, uh, Sarah, to continue to have this an ongoing conversation and uh, also providing ongoing support. You know, uh, I know that that's already happening. I'm not um, um, drawing any conclusion, but uh, my guess is that this is the product of an uh, attitude from this center which is there to be inclusive, to be understanding, merciful, and compassionate, and really be with people where they are. So I would say um, any effort is always appreciated, especially for those families who feel that, that they might be uh, stigmatized because they have a child or because there is a person with a special need. Red Honda CRV lights on outside parking lot. All right. Okay. So, uh, how I think the community can benefit is, first of all, I like to say all of us are temporary able. So eventually, we will become disabled. My issue is a mobility issue. So I like to. Ha I have a list here. So I'm going to begin with how the community can benefit is the exposure can educate the people around us simply by being physically present. Many of our brothers and sisters do not know about disabilities and mostly are willing to learn and help. This is an opportunity for us taking accountability of what we know and sharing to the community. First of all, you may notice that during times of Ramadan and Eid or special events, people do like to park in the handicapped spots if they're in a rush. And these parking spots are there for a reason. So if an unauthorized vehicle is there, somebody just do your part. Just, just write a note on the letter, and if it needs be, you can call the authority. It's, don't be ashamed for what is out there for you. Another thing is that a lot of people love to use the handicapped stalls. Now, I understand that's spacious and comfortable, but there's a reason why it's spacious and comfortable. I use a wheelchair. A lot of people use electric wheelchairs, and we can't fit into the normal stalls. And so I don't mind sharing my disability, so I don't have bladder or bowel control. So if I'm waiting for somebody to exit the stall, I just smile when the person exits because 
They don't know, but I had to let them know, hey, because of you, I wet my pants. Because of you, my bowels came out. So, I mean, I have no shame. So, this is something that we all need to be aware of. Um, now, if you do see somebody in line with, who has a disability or in the wheelchair, allow them to take the front of the line and let them use the handicap stall. Um, another thing is that some people like to park where they, sometimes vans allow to use the lift and there are special strips on the white strips on the ground. People like to park there sometimes and if you do block that area, the person who has a lift or myself who has a wide door, I can't get out with making my wheelchair outside. So like, I have to repark the car and make my uh, trip to the mosque much longer. Uh, another thing that everyone loves to do is to lift, they love to leave their shoes out in front of the entrances, including the bathroom entrances, such as the slippers. Now for somebody like myself who has the ability to go over the slippers, I have no issue. But somebody with a manual chair, that can cause some sort of uh, obstacles. Now, in general, that's a fire hazard, or that's a, that's a danger zone. So somebody, if there's an earthquake or something going on and people are trying to rush out out of the building, people can trip. Uh, so this is a serious issue. So if it's not your shoes, and if it is your shoes, just pick them up and move it to the sh where it needs to be. Um, another thing I like to talk about is just, again, exposure. Just being here present, um, it may be so that some family members or people in our community are uncomfortable with the types of disabilities that are out there. Whatever the reason they have, by us not participating in functions because of the lack of love received from the community, community or lack of accommodation due to the infrastructure, we will make the, it will make the outing for us more difficult. But just one of our, this is just one of our many struggles, particularly our social struggles. So in the Quran, chapter 49, verse 13, there's a verse that I love to re reflect on. O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female, and, in, and made you people and tribes that you may know one another. So we're all created differently, so I'd like for you guys to just reflect on that. Again, our exposure can educate and take steps to create changes in our community. And it's our U.S. citizens' rights, so if there's an issue, you can definitely escalate that. Um, I was going to talk about my company, but I already spoke more about that, so if anyone has more interest in what we do, I would say that uh, how the community can benefit is create gatherings or outings in the mosque or outside the mosque. Um, by creating community gatherings, we can benefit from unity. From my experience working at BORP, I have witnessed how a community can come together and grow from what was lacking to, to providing resources for the disabled community. The Adaptive Cycling Center has grown as an outreach center where riders can become members and use equipment when they visit. So if here at the mosque, now I'm not suggesting that we have some sort of like athletic program, but we can gain for something from having all of us come together. Uh, members who have a place in the community during, so, I mean, the mosque is usually open mostly, so people who just come together, this can be a place of belonging. So if you do see somebody out there who has a disability or you see a parent who's struggling, you know, a smile does go a long way. And Islam alaikum, of course, means peace. So if you guys know that, understanding the true meaning of that, live up to it. Um, and I like to say that my program also provides uh, financial assistance with adaptive sports or adaptive equipments. Um, now, I know here in the Bay Area, a lot of us are uh, really well in um, having a lot of money. So if there are people out there who want to help families with disabilities, there are ways they can help out a lot. Uh, sports equipment is not expensive. My personal bike cost me $7,500. Um, and so it goes a long way if you go out helping financially or spiritually or just physically.
I now like each of you to just go more into depth on a depth on how we um, the rest of the community and how we can all work together to kind of eliminate the stereotypes that are typically associated with the special needs community or people with disabilities. So eliminating stereotypes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Brother Abdullah was, I think, said volumes about that, about how a smile goes a long way. I would agree with that. Um, but also, there's, um, it, it's it, this is a, a very difficult question because um, you have to really look inside of you to see um, what your value systems are. And, um, you know, here I'm kind of preaching to the choir. I mean, you guys have special needs. That's where you're here. But, um, you know, I think it's great that, that MCC is opening uh, the doors to the first community iftar. Uh, you were very specific as an organization to say this is specifically for special needs uh, families. And I think um, to make it kind of exclusive, it gives more of a safe space creating a safe space for, um, you know, families with uh, special needs to come out and uh, get help or, um, you know, just have some opportunity for socialization. Because, um, you know, you all, my experience has been that, um, you know, it, no matter, a, a lot of it is that you, if you have a special, a child with special need, it just, it, it doesn't matter what religion you are, what race you are, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it binds you together as a family, especially when you have special needs in your family. So, um, yeah, um, that's about it. It's a, it's a process. I just have a couple of hours to um, use of your time now to say something about that, but I would say that, that um, one of the evils in every community is ignorance. And I think when we're ignorant about something, then we just make up stories, we uh, create our own interpretation of what's going on, we uh, reinforce stereotypes and the stigma and so on and so forth. So I would say that um, the opposite of ignorance is obviously education. So I would say take every opportunity to educate. There are times when we can talk about autism. What is autism? People don't know about autism. What are the manifestations of autism? You know, when you see a child that is behaving a certain way, don't judge the parents. You know, that, that's common. I hear that often from parents. A child is, um, is moving around or making some noises and they just start looking at the parent. You're a bad parent, right? People don't know. In the end, is people are ignorant. They don't know what's going on. So, um, uh, um, as I have suggested earlier, this ongoing effort can include education. And I think, um, um, uh, you know, uh, events like this, having uh, other times during the year where the, that conversation goes on, and utilizing resources that you have, like Family Resource Navigators, is a fantastic. A resource that you have and you can contact them and say you know come here talk to us about this or that integrate these resources that already exist in the community to to keep the education going on and also she mentioned care pair network in uh, in Contra Costa we partner with them they're fantastic because they are out there in the community doing the work with the families so um, education is uh, I think is critical to uh, minimize uh, the stereotypes. To break the stereotypes, I like to say, it is what it is. So take owner, take own from what, take ownership of what's going on. And I love the idea of just exposure, showing up, be present, let people see what's going on. If there is a disability, there, there's no shame involved. I mean, a lot of the family members are part of dealing the same thing, whether it be visible or invisible, we all have a struggle. And then we, we are part of this ummah, so let's not forget that. So it took me so long to get the questions, so 
so it comes first, but uh, yeah. What I wanted to say, reducing story type is very, very complicated and difficult. There is some implicit service app and explicit service app. So what we can do to help is like uh, fight the ignorance and we cannot know everything about every single diagnosis. It is super hard to uh, really understand because we may be familiarized with one diagnosis but not the other. But what I, I will suggest is just be human, be nice, be considerate and sensitive to the other person. We all are human. We all, although we look normal, we all have deficits and we all have needs. They may be not showing but we all have needs so just be nice and prompt everybody to be nice to others um, we're approaching Ifdadi now, so we're going to close off the end of this panel of speakers. Um, thank you so much for, for all coming to this portion of the event. Um, we can now all enter the banquet hall over there for Ifdadi, prayer, and then dinner. Um, but please don't let the con these kind of conversations end. If you want to talk to any of the speakers individually, um, you can do so um, during dinner as well. as This is an opportunity for all of you to meet each other because this is a community in itself and we want everyone to know each other and have that kind of support system. And um, please also come up to me because I'm open to any kind of suggestions on what kind of programs we should implement at the mosque here um, for the future because that's definitely um, something we need to do and keep as an ongoing thing. But thank you all. And